Okay, so I think we are ready to start. Um, I think we have somehow like 20 seconds more to 3 p.m. and there are already so many people in the audience. Uh, but don't worry if uh, others are joining and they're a little bit late because um, I will be speaking for a moment. So I would like to welcome you to the webinar uh, in which we'll be discussing the rule of law in Poland and assessing the effectiveness of European mechanisms to foster the rule of law in Poland. And my name is Anna Wójcik, and I'm coordinator of uh, the rule of law monitoring projects uh, named the Viktor Osiatyński Archive and the rule of law in Poland blog, in addition to some other uh, academic activities. And uh, we are, of course, delighted to have you all here with us. Thank you for joining, for taking time to be the part of this event. And one note, the event is supported by the Active Citizens National Program, which is one of the 11 programs implemented in Poland with funding from the European Economic Area Financial Mechanism and the Norwegian Financial Mechanism, known as the Norwegian and EA grants for the period 2014-2021. It's one of the two programs dedicated to supporting activities of civil society organizations. And the aim of the fund is to strengthen civil society, promote civic engagement and empower marginalized groups at risk of exclusion. And today we will empower ourselves and our knowledge um, by discussing to what extent the European mechanism have been able to foster compliance with the rule of law in Poland. So, we have some fantastic panelists joining us in alphabetical order. We have Jakub Bieraczewski, who is research coordinator at Democracy Reporting International, expert on the rule of law in the European Union, and previously participated in many international research projects at Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznań, Poland. He also taught constitutional law. Polina Kieszkowska knapik is attorney at law, co-founder of the Free Courts Initiative, Wolne Sądy in Polish, recognized among others with the Citizens' Prize of the European Parliament. She's also co-founder of KRK Kieszkowska Rutkowska Kolasinski Law Firm in Warsaw, and she's been engaged for many years in defense of the rule of law, but also patients' rights. She was honored by National Bar Council with the Distinguished Attorney at Law Badge for actions related to the defense of the rule of law. Our third panelist is Anna Sodestein, who is senior researcher at the Swedish Institute for European Policy Studies in Stockholm. Her research interests focus on institutional and constitutional law of the European Union. She obtained her PhD at the European University Institute in Florence, where she also worked as a researcher, and she has taught at the Faculty of Law at Uppsala University. She also served as the editor-in-chief of Journal, International Journal of Constitutional Law, and we are very happy to, to have you here with us. Martin Schwedt is a Doctor of Laws, is a graduate of the Faculty of Law Administration at the University of Warsaw. He also has an LLM uh, in Comparative Constitutional Law Studies from Central European University, back when it was in Budapest only, and he is Assistant Professor at the Department of Constitutional Law at the Faculty of Law and Administration of the University of Warsaw, and also Coordinator of the Strategic Litigation Program at the Helsinki Foundation for Human Rights. So, without much further ado, uh, I will just brief you that today we will examine the European mechanism for safeguarding the rule of law, and we will reflect on whether they are effective or not. And our panelists will have an opportunity to define whether what actually effective stands for. So we will begin by examining the European Union's political mechanism, then we'll turn to legal mechanism, then we will move to other mechanisms currently at play in Poland, for instance, famous rule of law milestones, and we will close the first round by uh, discussing the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, the current case law that we know and the one that is upcoming. So I'm, I would like to begin by first asking Anna about uh, Sweden's presidency uh, in the Council of the EU. And uh, one of the priorities of this presidency is safeguarding EU values. So what in your opinion has the presidency achieved so far in this regard concerning Poland? But you can also, of course, speak of Hungary if you wish to. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anna. Very nice to, to be here on this very distinguished panel. 
Um, and I just want to add that um, I was the associate editor of ICON and nothing else. Then. Um, so uh, when it comes to the Swedish presidency, the rotating presidency um, of the Council of the EU, so this is one of the actors of the EU alongside European Commission and the Court of Justice of, of the European Union that can bring about change when it comes to the rule of law. And Sweden holds the presidency in the first half of 2023 until end of June. Um, and there seems to be limited research on the role of the rotating presidencies when it comes to the rule of law, but by examining uh, the presidency programs and priorities of the last few years, um, it becomes clear that almost all of them are mentioning the EU Union's values or the rule of law in one way or another. And in the Swedish presidency program, which was presented in December in 2022, the rule of law appears as one of the four priorities. So what does this mean? Um, the fact that something is mentioned in the program, in the presidency program, has, of course, a some symbolic significance, but um, it also needs to be concretized and pursued in some way, of course. So um, what tools does the presidency, the rotating presidency has as its disposal. So one way, one task of the rotating presidency is to organize hearings under the so-called Article 7 procedure. So under this procedure, the council may determine that there is a clear risk of a serious breach by a member state of the rule of law. And there are no sanctions under this procedure. It's only about the council making this determination. So in other words, the only consequence of the procedure is naming and shaming. And it's been activated by the European Commission against Poland in 2017 and against, and the European Parliament activated it against Hungary in 2018. And since then, the Council has held several, several hearings with Poland and hun Hungary, 10 in total, but it has not yet voted on the matter. So it has not yet voted on that there is a clear risk of a serious breach. So, and what is it required is a four-fifth majority of the member states in the Council and the approval of the European Parliament. So some observers, some scholars claim that the reason why the council has not yet voted on the matter is not a requirement for a majority, the four fifth majority, but rather a political reluctance to single each other out in this way. So organizing hearings and thereby keeping the article seven procedure going is an optional tool available for the rotating presidency. Um, but still, Article 7 hearings are not held regularly, but the European Parliament has, uh, demands that, has demanded that they should be held regularly. And, um, and Sweden has decided to organize hearings against both Poland and Hungary, and uh, they will take place on the 30th of May, so in a week. So, and the process is not an open one. So we don't know much about it. We don't know much about what issues will come up and how it is actually going on. But we do know, do know that later on, uh, it will be more difficult to organize an Article 7 hearing because Hungary holds the presidency from July 2024 and then Poland will hold the presidency in the first half of 2025. And I don't think any of these member states will organize hearings, at least how it looks like right now. And another task of the rotating presidency when it comes to the rule of law would be the following up of the milestones that both Poland and Hungary must reach in order to get money from the recovery fund. And the Swedish Minister for EU Affairs, Jessica Roswall, has explained 
that the presidency will follow these issues very closely together with the European Commission, but we don't know much more there, but apparently there's, this is one task also of the, of the presidency. Um, an additional thing that the Swedish government will do is organize a, a major conference in the end of June, that is also towards the end of the presidency. So what will limit the room for maneuver that Swedish that the rotating presidency has? Uh, I think for the Swedish presidency, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the need to preserve unity uh, among the EU member states is the single most, is the one Im most important issue. Um, and the challenge here is of course to make progress in the rule of law crisis while not threatening the unity among the EU member states. And this is, of course, a very delicate balancing act. And there is also the domestic parliamentarian situation. The Swedish central right government is a minority government, which is supported by the far right populist Sweden Democrats, the second largest party in the Swedish parliament. So this is a typical populist far right political party. Um, so in the European Parliament, they belong to the ECR group, the European Conservatives and Reformists group, which often vote against rule of law measures taken by the EU. So and it might be the case that the Swedish EU presidency would have been able, would be able to push the rule of law issues more decisively without the Sweden Democrats at the no negotiating table, but we just do not know. So, um, but all in all, I actually found it surprising, a bit surprising that the Swedish presidency will actually organize Article 7 hearings under these circumstances against both Poland and Hungary. And especially perhaps against Hungary, because um, as you know, Sweden is the, in the late stages of negotiating its entry into the NATO, or it's, uh, it's waiting for ratification um, um, by Turkey and Hungary. So, so, um, so in light of this, I, I, I found it a bit, a bit surprising. But, uh, but these are some things that the rotating presidency could do, and it, it appears that Sweden is doing that. So. Thank you very much, Anna. That was a great summary. And also, it has been a big surprise, I think, for the rule of law monitoring and acting crowd to see that there will be finally a hearing regarding Poland and Hungary. Um, and let's move uh, to other political dimensions um, with Jakub. Uh, Jakub, you have been for many years criticizing, as many other people, uh, somehow sluggish, uh, underwhelming response of the European Commission, including through the use of legal mechanism to the democratic backsliding in Poland and Hungary. But it appears that in recent years or months, it some, something has changed. So what is your take on uh, the European Commission's use of legal mechanism to foster compliance with the rule of law in Poland, but also in Hungary, if you wish? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Anja, and thank you very much for the invitation to this event and the opportunity to contribute to uh, the discussion. Um, in terms of my assessment of uh, what the European Commission has been doing recently when it comes to the rule of law in uh, uh, EU member states, in particular uh, Hungary and Poland, I think that we have some of the good and some of the bad, perhaps as usual. Um, the European Commission has in general abandoned uh, what uh, it could be described as the political dialogue phase of dealing with uh, rule of law issues in Hungary and Poland, where the primary means of resolving the issue was seen by discussion with the government and trying to convince the ruling parties, coalitions in those countries to alter their course and to um, uh, uh, stop uh, damaging the EU values inside of the country. Uh, so this phase is uh, fortunately behind us and we have moved to a phase of uh, enforcement and of the European Commission actually using uh, some of the tools it has at disposal. And we have seen several developments which are now definitely positive here. We have seen the use of financial pressure on those uh, EU member states done in many ways um, through uh, withholding the payout of the uh, COVID-19 recovery fund towards both Hungary and Poland, 
and with withholding cohesion funds. Uh, and in both cases, the rule of law was uh, cited as a reason why those funds are being withheld and that uh, improvement must happen and reforms must be made in order for the money to be released. We have also seen the first ever use of the rule of law conditionality mechanism, so far only against Hungary, but a welcome development because this has been touted and uh, advertised as the primary tool of dealing with uh, rule of law issues in EU member states uh, through applying uh, a concrete uh, conditionality and thus also financial pressure on those member states. We have also recently seen uh, the launch of several infringement procedures. Uh, uh, I would maybe talk a little bit more about the infringement procedure uh, with regards to Poland and the Polish Constitutional Tribunal. After many years of uh, this tribunal lacking independence and being uh, composed of uh, a bench, including unlawfully appointed judges, finally in 2021, after several highly problematic and damaging judgments of the tribunal, which were aimed at uh, undermining the authority of the European Union, and in particular the Court of Justice of the European Union, in 2021, the Commission finally launched an infringement procedure, spent over a year exchanging letters with the government in Warsaw and uh, 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 figuring out how to proceed further. And in the end, has arrived at the point where the uh, Commission concluded that the dialogue would not get anywhere and it must send the case to the Court of Justice claiming that there are significant problems with the Polish Constitutional Tribunal, primarily that the Tribunal lacks independence and is uh, no longer an impartial course that is uh, free from undue influence from politicians, but also uh, citing the status of judges of the Tribunal, with uh, 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 judges being unlawfully appointed or appointed to seats which were previously held by unlawfully appointed people. So those are definitely positive developments, and it's good to see them. But there are also issues with the European Union's reaction to the rule of law um, that continue to persist. And I would like to highlight uh, at least two of them. First is that the rule of law conditionality mechanism has been applied towards Hungary, but has not been applied towards Poland. And in the end of 2021, the European Commission sent uh, informal letters to Poland and Hungary indicating the scope of the rule of law conditionality procedure, which would be used against both countries and clearly signaling its determination to go forth and to use this procedure. And then what happened was that um, the war in Ukraine broke out. And following that, uh, the Commission decided to use the rule of law conditionality mechanism against Hungary, but did not trigger it towards Poland. And the way I see it is uh, that very likely the Commission decided that uh, it cannot apply additional pressure on a country which is supporting Ukraine so greatly as Poland is, and is, uh, holding, uh, is uh, um, accepting so many refugees and supporting also Ukraine financially and militarily, and has decided, I think, to refrain from piling more on the country and did not use the rule of law conditionality procedure. Um, the case, uh, the procedure, the infringement procedure regarding the Constitutional Tribunal has also been problematic in some ways. First of all, while the European Commission has stated earlier this year that it will send a case to the European Court of Justice and it will take Poland for that court over the state of the Constitutional Tribunal, as of now, that case has still not been lodged with the CGEU. And I have seen no indication of the actual text of the application being up available anywhere and definitely not with the court itself. So either the commission is taking very long time to send a letter to Luxembourg or there are some other problems uh, along the way with finishing this procedure and moving to the next stage of taking Poland before the court. Above all, I think that uh, it's all way too late. The Polish Constitutional Tribunal has not been independent since 2016 at the very latest and has unlawfully appointed judges sitting there also since that time. And it took the European Commission five years to finally act upon it and to um, react to the fact that one of the member states has a constitutional court which lacks independence and is uh, uh, undertaking activities which are highly damaging not only to the Polish law, but also to the EU law as a whole. So unfortunately, it's a mixed bag and we've seen both good and the bad in the, over the last uh, uh, two years, and uh, it's uh, hard to clear a conclusive picture of uh, 
a, a consistent picture of commission sent towards the um, member states, which uh, damage the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you, Jakob. That was a really good overview. And of course, we cannot make conclusions on the commission's as, uh, steps towards uh, member states because this crisis is suddenly not over. And why it's not over? What are particular things that are still need to be amended and how actually the Polish authorities are responding to the so-called uh, rule of law milestones that were already mentioned? I will ask those questions to Paulina kieszkowska knapik Paulina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting uh, for inviting me. Um, well, as, as an attorney um, participating with my colleagues who represent uh, represented judges in in front of both tribunals and who won uh, all those cases, it's it's really sad for me to say that law stopped working um, in Poland. We have verdicts which bind Poland from both Strasbourg and Luxembourg tribunals. There is more than 30 of them now and probably 300 more coming because that's a number of cases which which uh, the rule of law in, initiated or caused in, um, in Strasbourg tribunal. There's going to be more in Luxembourg as well. And those verdicts um, decisively confirm that all parts of the, as we call them, deforms of the Polish judiciary system are against the treaties um, and the convention that we are bound with. Obviously, the politically captured tribunal uh, that Jakub was referring to uh, tried, tries to paralyze those verdicts. And um, uh, that's one of the reasons why the commission decided to launch a case against this um, tribunal, which is not a tribunal anymore, really, because it doesn't fulfill the control function over those power anymore. But legally speaking, obviously, such a verdict issued by a political body, which is um, uh, uh, wrongly composed, are not binding. And also the constitutional court of one country cannot withdraw from conventions and treaties that we are bound. So we have um, a, a, a roadmap which is resulting from those verdicts, how the situation should be cured. Uh, not all of them are perfectly clear, but altogether they form some kind of um, umbrella, legal umbrella under which we could, we could um, try to build the way out. And this is what was done by uh, Justitia, the Association of Judges, together with many NGOs. We prepared a draft law which implements all those verdicts, which is very much in spirit of what the European judges claim in their case against the Commission and the Council, stating that all of those judgments should be uh, executed and not, not only three, which are the basis for the milestones. But even those three, which are the basis for milestones, requirements for Poland to do the minimum to, to get the recovery money are not fulfilled. And um, you, can, you can see from those laws which uh, the government presents as implementing milestones that there is no real will to actually cure the situation. There is no real will to have independent judiciary. Uh, there is a, an, a political idea to actually keep the judges um, afraid of the executive power to influence the verdicts. And you have endless examples of promoting judges who do uh, verdicts expected, of uh, punishing judges who issue verdicts which are uncomfortable for the government. We see this happening and none of those laws, neither the one prepared by uh, President Duda, which the commission didn't consider enough, um, and the one which, uh, which was pr uh, prepared now and which was subject to constitutional claim uh, protest of, of, of Mr. Duda, none of them actually implements the milestones. None of them secures the proper disciplinary procedure, which is independent from the Ministry of Justice and the whole political world. None of them secures um, the status of those judges who were harassed. Some of them were um, uh, called back to their positions, but they keep on being harassed and moved uh, this in a disciplinary uh, uh, way from different districts, different places, and they are still subject to, to harassment. 
Um, and finally, the, the choice of the court, which should take uh, care of such cases, is, is still completely out of constitutional context. Now, the idea is to give those cases to the uh, Supreme Administrative Court, which is a very vicious idea because that will kill this court, which is the last court, which has a majority of legally appointed judges, even though one third is already new judges. Plus this court is a final um, and the only court in Poland which can control the executive because it actually overrules the decisions and all sorts of administrative acts. So the idea to flood it with uh, disciplinary proceedings and independence tests, which by the way is also a devil's concept because the citizen cannot be left with proving that the judge is a judge. I mean, this is a complete reverse of what uh, the judiciary should be all about. Anyway, the, this law uh, states that the panels of seven, five, seven judges will sit on those cases and give verdicts in 14 days, which will mean that this court will be totally paralyzed and it will not hear proper cases against the government. I specialize in the healthcare um, system, so this is my court and this is where I argue my cases, also pro bono cases for patients, and they already take five years for a final verdict, so I cannot imagine how uh, that will work. So uh, in a way, this draft law is like killing two birds with one stone. Um, it will be proposed as pseudo execution of milestones. Truly in real life, it will paralyze the last court which uh, controls the executive. Um, not to mention that it's stuck in the middle of this political um, battle within the, the captured political uh, the constitutional tribunal where we have a reflection of the coalition battles and uh, the judges and doublers cannot sit together because they cannot agree on who represents what um, view on this law. And we have a reflection of a political uh, battle uh, on, the, on the right side of a political scene within the tribunal with no clear prospect to actually cut this, this uh, crisis. And even if it's... Um, solved and the verdict is issued uh, it will mean nothing legally really because there will be doublers in this in the in the panel plus it will uh, confirm potentially the constitutionality of law which is totally unconstitutional and which is totally against the milestones so we are in the catch-22 um, i don't see a real way out of that um, maybe just the change of force of power could change it, but the issue is that this legal system, a rule of law system, is also involved in election process, and the election process was also politicized from A to Z, from the, the, the way the election rules are formed, the proper election body, which was judges before, was dissolved, and politicians now are in the supreme election body. The election chamber of the Supreme Court is interested in the result of elections because it's, again, neo judges who were appointed at this whole chaos. So at every entrance to this system, we have like a usher spiler, you know, where we lose the whole sense of, um, of democracy. So even the election process is already poisoned with this whole crisis. The same regards. Uh, coming elections to European Parliament, and we will we will um, elect Polish MPs to this Parliament, and the, the same structural issues about lack of fairness, um, the total total bias of, of public media uh, with uh, with uh, those at power. Uh, that we don't have fair elections anymore, which was already confirmed by OECD in the in the former elections for the president. Uh, so. In the middle of the European Union, we have a bit of a um, rotten uh, system, which uh, is based on uh, legal concepts, which were all, all defined as Soviet or post-Soviet post by the Venice Committee when they, in 2016, assessed this whole concept upon question from the very government. Um, this report in 2016 already confirmed that the, the mechanisms which were introduced in this um, deform are of Soviet nature, right? So we are reversing to something that the whole Europe is fighting against, the Sovietism of law. 
right? The lack of um, uh, division of powers, the lack of free media, the lack of free elections, the lack of uh, uh, real protection of human rights. We are sliding into something which is very similar to what happened in Russia. Uh, it's, it's very, very sad because as a society, we rebel against that. But obviously, if the election mechanisms are changed, uh, even if the majority of us disagrees with that, we have no effective ways to actually uh, prove it, to actually change this whole situation. So it's, it's, it's very sad on every front, but it should be understood internationally that this crisis it does it cannot be compromised with you with a help for Ukraine? On the contrary, we are helping Ukraine because Ukraine doesn't want to be Russia, Russia which does not recognize, which did not recognize the verdicts of the European Court of Human Rights, which went out of the convention, which uh, breaches every single possible human right you can you can name, and this is why Ukraine doesn't want to be there. They want to be with us. And we, as, as, as a group of countries, as European Union, we cannot therefore tolerate a situation where all those rules are breached. Um, so my um, legal uh, assessment is that we want everything we could in front of those tribunals. By we, I mean Polish judiciary, uh, uh, um, Polish lawyers who, who fought to protect rule of law. Now it's in hands of politicians really how to react to that. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights did an amazing job. <laughs> European Court of, uh, the, the Court of Justice of European um, uh, Union also did sit on so many cases and tried to solve them in the most comprehensive way. So the judges did their job. And now it's for the politicians to understand what uh, was also underlined by judges um, uh, of Europe. You cannot compromise on that. Either we have a rule of law uh, community or we are similar to chaos. If uh, law doesn't rule, it's the force which rules. And then we do not differ that much uh, from the countries that we are fighting against. So that would be from for my answer to your question. Sorry for being a little bit late, but it's uh, complicated because legally speaking, everything should be all right, but factually it's not. It's also difficult to ask uh, questions that are politically loaded to a lawyer. And uh, just to, um, to clarifications, Poland will have elections, general elections in late 2023. We don't know the exact dates yet. And the other qualification is perhaps um, a bridge to uh, Martin's presentation is that there are uh, more than 300 cases brought to European Court of Human Rights um, in relation to the rule of law crisis in Poland. And the question is to Martin, uh, who has been working on those cases, monitoring many of those cases very closely, is what do we know so far from this case law? and what is yet to be uncovered, decided by the court, and what is going to happen perhaps quite soon. Mm -hmm. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for your invitation. Uh, responding to your question, uh, the European Court of Human Rights issued so far eight judgments concerning various aspects of the rule of law crisis in Poland. And in light of this judgment, it is clear that participation of unlawfully elected persons in the constitutional tribunal panels uh, can lead to violation of Article 6 of the Convention. Moreover, it is clear that the judges of the Supreme Court, uh, which were recently appointed upon the motion of the new National Council of Judiciary, which was politicized after the reform from 2017, uh, were appointed with manifest violation of law, and so their participation in court panels may lead to violation of the right to a tribunal established by law. Uh, it is equally clear that various forms of harassment of Polish judges through disciplinary measures or through some informal sanctions may lead to violation of Article 8, uh, 10, uh, and even Article 18, as was confirmed in the case of Judge uh, Justician. Uh, likewise, the, the European Court of Human Rights confirmed that dismissal of court's presidents in 2017 and 18 were arbitrary, and that equally arbitrary was premature termination of the term of office of the uh, NCJ members in 2000. 
17. At the same time, there have been, there are several issues which have not yet been resolved by the court, but which were touched upon in this 300 cases or even more cases uh, which have been uh, pending right now before the European Court of Human Rights. I will now focus only on three types of such cases, but there are much more of them, Much there, there are very important issues uh, in all of them. So the first and probably the most important types of cases, uh, most important from the perspective of uh, Poland is are the cases concerning the status of new judges of courts other than the Supreme Court. So so far, the, the European Court issued four judgments concerning um, judges of the Supreme Court of various chambers of the Supreme Court, but no judgment concerning uh, judges of other courts than Supreme Court. Um, however, there are around 2,000 2, unlawfully appointed judges who adjudicate, for example, in ordinary courts or the administrative courts. And the question is whether their participation in court panels adjudicating in individual cases may also lead to violation of the right to a tribunal established by law. So according to the jurisprudence of the Polish Supreme Court, participation of the newly appointed judges in ordinary court panels does not always have to lead to violation of a, a, a validity of proceedings. Uh, in order to determine whether such legal consequences uh, occur, it is necessary to uh, conduct a, 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 a test to establish whether uh, these irregularities in the appointment lead to a violation of the right to an independent and impartial uh, court, what must be assessed using criteria specified in the resolution of the Supreme Court. <laughs> However, it seems that uh, those judgments of the European Court, which have been issued so far, leave little space for such differentiation of status of judges of the Supreme Court and other judges, because the European Court of Human Rights clearly link the violation of the right to a tribunal established by law with the fact of the unlawful appointment, appointment on the basis of nomination of the new National Council of Judiciary. Therefore, if the mere fact that the judge of the Supreme Court was appointed upon the motion of the new NCJ is sufficient to violate to establish a violation of Article 6 of the Convention, it may be argued that the same violation occurs in case of all judges, all other judges who are appointed in the same uh, way. We have to keep in mind, however, that the Astratson test used by the courts to assess whether violation of uh, law in the process of judicial appointments leads to breach of Article 6 of the Convention has three steps. And these two first steps concern examination of the scale of irregularities in the appointment of a judge, while the third one <coughs> analyzes whether such irregularities were effectively reviewed and remedied by domestic courts. And in all Polish cases considered so far by the court, this third step of Astrason test did not really matter because uh, the, there has been no review of unlawful appointments at the domestic level. Uh, however, with regards to judges of ordinary courts, this situation may be slightly different because parties to proceedings may raise challenges against composition of courts via motions to, for the exclusion of judges or via uh, ordinary or extraordinary means of appeal. Therefore, there may be some uh, procedures for review of this unlawful uh, appointment. Uh, it will be therefore interesting to see whether such review of individual independence and impartiality of unlawful judges, for example, as provided in the resolution of the Supreme Court, may help to prevent violation of Article 6. For example, it will be particularly important to see whether in some circumstances a careful examination of status of unlawfully appointed judge may justify decision of the second instance court to uphold the ruling issued by a judge appointed in such a way. Um, undoubtedly, undoubtedly uh, the court judgments on the status of unlawfully appointed judges may have huge impact on the situation uh, in Poland. And what is uh, also important, um, if the court confirms that uh, such judges were also appointed with violation of law and their participation in the cases may lead to violation of the convention, and uh, this may lead to a huge influx of new cases uh, uh, to the European Court of Human Rights, because already at the moment there are thousands of unlawful appointed judges and their number is constantly growing, and they issue thousands or even millions of rulings uh, every year. Therefore, uh, it would be very interesting to see how would the court uh, deal with such potentially very high number of similar cases. We may, for example, expect the using of the pilot judgment procedure. However, one may wonder whether such procedure would uh, actually be effective in this case in a situation where Polish authorities 
not only reject any possibility of enforcing the European court judgments, but also outright undermine their validity and binding force. <laughs> Besides the problem of unlawful judicial appointments, I would just to briefly mention two types of cases which are which could be very uh, important from the perspective of the interpretation of the European Convention. First of them concern uh, the so-called extraordinary complaint the to the Supreme Court, which makes it possible to challenge on rather broad and vague grounds judgments which were issued uh, many years ago. And in this case, uh, brought by President uh, Valenza, the European Court even considers using the pilot judgment procedure. And the second types of cases concern uh, those uh, applications in which judges, uh, which were subject to various forms of harassment, um, raise a challenge that as a result of such actions, their subjective rights to have the judicial independence safeguarded and respected were violated. And the problem here is that so far, the European Court of Human Rights has never explicitly recognized that such subjective right of a judge is guaranteed under Article 6 of the Convention, because uh, mostly uh, cases which concern various aspects of threats to judicial independence were analyzed through the prism of Article 6, but on procedural grounds mostly, access to court, or Article 8 on substantive grounds if there were some implications, serious implications in the judges' private lives. However, if the European Court of Human Rights decides to reinterpret Article 6 and explicitly recognize that such subjective right of a judge to have his independence protected, uh, is recognized uh, in, the, in the jurisprudence of the court, this could make it more easy for judges to uh, raise challenges in, in complaints to European court. It also will extend the um, jurisdiction of the court to deal with such uh, cases, what, what could have significant uh, uh, consequences on the interpretation of the convention, not only in Polish cases, but also in many other European cases. So these were only three types of cases. We could also mention many other, for example, cases concerning abortion, which uh, deal not only with this procedural, formal aspects of the rule of law crisis in the constitutional tribunal, but also very serious threats to the rights of thousands of women in Poland. But of course, unfortunately, I do not have time to deal with all of these cases in details. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcin. Fortunately, this project will be going on for some time, so maybe we will have another meeting and we'll be discussing uh, certain types of these cases that you mentioned in more detail. Um, so to the audience, uh, the format of this meeting is that now we'll have a shorter round of interventions um, because I will abuse my power to ask another question to our panelists. And uh, then we open Q&A uh, session and you are more than welcome to post uh, already your questions in the comment section and I will be reading them to our panelists and they will answer if they of course want and uh, uh, we will still have time. So um, my next question would be to Anna, uh, getting back to Article 7 that you mentioned that we'll be having a hearing in, um, in um, more than a week. So what actually is your opinion on this mechanism of the European Union in relation to its ability to actually safeguard the, uh, the rule of law and to foster its compliance? Because from the Polish perspective, it looks somehow it was now first launched as atomic uh, option, but after all those years, we have a little bit forgotten about it. So maybe there is something that we don't see anymore. Uh, Anna, we cannot hear you. Just sorry about that. No. <laughs> um, well, I think that uh, most academic scholars are very critical to Article 7 and how it is constructed. Um, and it actually um, consists of, of two different procedures. Um, first, the warning procedure that the Commission activated against Poland in 2017 and the European Parliament activ activated against Hungary in 2018. Uh, and the sanctioning procedure that has not yet been applied. And I think it was actually the the sanctioning procedure that has been referred to, the atomic nuclear bomb. Uh, and, and because this sanction procedure, it should be applied when a member state has already seriously infringed EU values. So, and it's in the treatise that talked about the existence of a serious and persistent breach of EU values. And this procedure, the sanctions procedure, may result in a member state being subject to some form of sanction, such as losing the right to vote in the council. So 
maybe that's why this is the harshest tool that the EU has um, to available. Um, but this procedure, the sanctions procedure, will of course be never applied because it requires unanimity among the member states. And Poland and Hungary are expected to back each other up. And Orban has also clearly stated that this would actually happen if the sanctions procedure were to be applied against Poland. Um, and sometimes I think in order to, to fix this, um, it is argued that Article 7 should be amended through a treaty revision and um, so that this requirement for unanimity should be removed. But of course, this will never work either because a treaty revision also requires unanimity. unanimity. So, but what had actually been applied is the warning procedure um, against both Poland and Hungary. And it is actually only about a risk that a member state concerned would breach the EU's values. And as I mentioned, there are no actual sanctions under these procedures, on, only about naming and shaming. But hearings have been going on in the Council for years, um, but it has not even put forward recommendations and yet it has not voted on the issue. So um, there is, seems to be a reluctance to come to that stage to, do, to voting on these issues. So there is a political reluctance and the political price for using it or to, to vote on it so far has been considered too high. But I think that one could argue that this reluctance could actually affect the EU's credibility in a way because the EU has a tool to deal with the situation but it's not using them to, to, to its full potential. So if possible, um, um, I think the, the, the engine should at least perhaps be kept running and to organize hearings. <clears throat> so uh, to organize hearings in a council with Poland and Hungary. This is an optional task for, for the presidency. So, but still uh, Article 7 hearings are not held regularly, as I said, although the European Parliament has demanded that it, they should be held regularly. So one way to improve this Article 7 procedure could be to make it mandatory or at least into a recommendation to for each rotating presidency to organize hearings. So, and this doesn't have to be done through a treaty change. It could be achieved by other means, by, by social pressures. So we don't have to wonder for each rotating presidency that if there will be a hearing or not. <clears throat> and also, I think it seems to be useful because uh, practitioners, um, government representatives, they, they say that the, the ongoing, the Article 7 procedures are very useful. It's a forum for discussion and a follow up on these issues, and they take place on a very high political level. So there are reasons to keep it, even if we will never reach the state of voting in the, in the council. And I think also in comparison to the conditionality tools um, that are now used against both Poland and Hungary to, to, to stop money from the EU funds, um, Article 7 procedure appears almost as soft. So, and, and I think in the end, I think as some, some scholars claim, the EU doesn't seem to be designed for, for conflicts of this kind. So, um, and also it would mean, it would demonstrate um, too much power maybe on the part of the EU, if, which could lead to more member states turning against the EU. If, if the um, conditionality mechanism would work too well. Um, so there are, I think there are reasons to, to continue using softer tools such as dialogue, in, which I think includes Article 7 procedure, the warning procedure, and are, that they are preferable to sanctions. But all in all, I think um, Article 7, it, th there are good reasons for keeping it and to continue organized hearings. Uh, but of course, in the end, there will be a credibility problem for, for the EU if, if it never leads to anything.
Thank you very much. That was um, a very sober assessment of uh, um, almost, I think, seven years with Article 7. Uh, and uh, now the question that actually is similar to a question that has appeared in the comments. Um, so the question to, to all of you, um, what actually can be meaningfully done at this moment by the EU and the Council of Europe institutions to make a meaningful change in the compliance of Poland with the rule of law. Because we are facing this moment of, uh, of course, electoral uncertainty, and it's a close, it should be a close call this year concerning elections in Poland. So we can reasonably also consider an option that the current government continues in power and we'll be faced with those continuing violations. So what can be done? Do you have any ideas? If I may. Um, so to answer this question, I think that there are a couple of things to consider. First of all, I believe that at this point, it is rather clear that only kind of pressure that truly works on countries that uh, violate the rule of law is financial pressure. And this leads to some kind of uh, uh, backtracking, to some kind of confession, to some kind of willingness to uh, climb back by uh, the governments that have uh, introduced such changes. Unfortunately, it also means that the two organizations that we are considering here, the European Union and the Council of Europe, have very different means at their disposal. The EU has significant possibilities of applying financial pressure in many ways. The Council of Europe, not so much. Um, and so, uh, drawing from that, I believe that, first of all, the EU should continue to use uh, those uh, tools and mechanisms that uh, result in concrete financial pressure. Um, uh, uh, we've seen the withdrawal of the uh, withholding the recovery fund towards Poland, leading to abolishing the disciplinary chamber, and uh, which is one of the biggest wins of the European Union when it comes to improving the rule of law in Poland. But what could be done towards uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 improving the link between both organizations could be, for example, for the European Union to consider the implementation of judgments of the European Court of Human Rights and the various EU rule of law mechanisms. So looking into it from the perspective that not respecting international and regional courts is in itself a rule of law problem. So we should also look into how the member states are respecting not only the European Court of Justice, but also other courts, including the European Court of uh, human rights. And I think that this is one way of kind of strengthening the, uh, strengthening the possible direct um, pressure coming from judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. I also believe that uh, for the EU infringement procedure by the Commission should be swift and followed with uh, quickly taking the country before the CGEU in case it does not want to comply. Uh, the length of those procedures, the uh, months and years which take for it to be initiated and then the long periods of exchanging letter, it's all happening while the damage is being done. So unfortunately here, the only thing that we can call for is that the European Commission should be much quicker in uh, applying those tools. Thank you. Can I? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, so while I may sound quite pessimistic, however, it's difficult for me to imagine that peace could be persuaded in any way to implement changes aimed at restoration of the uh, rule of law in, in Poland. I mean, from the perspective of the Council of Europe possibilities, of course, there are some uh, possibilities which has not been used at the moment. So, for example, the uh, committee of ministers could file an uh, could file a, an application against the against Poland under Article 46 of the Convention for failure to implement some judgments of the court, or maybe we can uh, maybe in in uh, upcoming uh, Reykjavik meeting there will be some proposals on how to make the process of uh, of of, um, of enforcement of of judges of judgments of the court make more effective. Nevertheless, I think that the war of Polish government with the European institution has gone so far that the complete withdrawal by peace from from undertaken reforms is is rather uh, impossible. And the only thing that we can expect to happen is this sort of some measures that we are now uh, seeing in the context of this further reforms of the Supreme Court, which maybe eliminate some small problems with terms of, you know, with regards to abuse of disciplinary responsibility of judges. Nevertheless, they do not address the fundamental sources of a violation of the rule of law, namely the, the composition of the National Council of Judiciary and, and a complete politicization of the a constitutional 
uh, uh, tribunal. Therefore, I think that without the political changes in, in, in Poland, uh, the full restoration of rule of law is highly uh, unlikely to take place. Thank you very much. Polina, maybe you have a more optimistic assessment. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, uh, firstly, we 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 believe that the Commission shouldn't buy the 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 law which is now in the tribunal, even if it's uh, accepted by this tribunal, because it doesn't solve any issue. Moreover, it kills the administrative court. Uh, so they should restart this discussion with the government and squeeze them to really implement at least those three verdicts, let alone twenty verdicts, which. I'm with Martin here on the pessimistic aspect where the, uh, there will be nothing done uh, which is not forced to be done. Uh, it, it went too far. But I also believe that the Commission should uh, launch the infringement and, uh, against the so-called neo Judiciary Council because it's a, like a pump of, uh, of, e of illegally um, uh, appointed judges. And uh, it's it's just uh, if if we don't stop this process, the whole system will be will be illegal very soon because they already um, form one third of the of the whole number of judges. So there will be nobody to work with uh, if we if we take it much longer. But also, I, I would like to point out that there is the optimistic side of this whole crisis because what happened. Uh, is that Polish judges, uh, with their cases, with their preliminary questions, with with and also us lawyers trying to show to the EU that this is an internal issue. It's not a Polish white bear issue. Okay, it's it's an issue within the European uh, uh, Union. Uh, the way the judges cooperate, the the importance of cooperation of judges, the importance of EU family of, of lawyers. This all was created thanks to this crisis. We have an amazing jurisprudence now of both courts, which can be used to protect the community in its uh, entire um, system. Uh, lawyers and judges all over Europe um, have the same language now, and there is there is opinions and, ju and judgments uh, of both tribunals to refer to, which I think in the long term, makes uh, this whole uh, uh, structure much more resilient towards such populistic uh, changes. And of course, from the from the egoistic point of view, I would love Poland to, to switch into a uh, proper rule of law system. I know it's not easy, but it's not impossible. As I said to you, it's uh, relatively doable. And there is, there is draft laws already prepared by NGOs and uh, uh, and civil society, which allow this to happen. So if we treat it as a vaccination uh, against such a phenomenon in other countries, that would be a positive outcome. If that is, of course, um, the most wanted result is that the patient, like Poland, will survive this illness. Um, if not, and if we become a fully autocratic a place on earth which which might happen quite soon if th this whole system is finally closed in a sort of concrete um, uh, neo system which doesn't uh, reflect the standards that will be our tragedy but if Europe can learn something from it please do um, because maybe that's 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 the chance for everybody to wake up and keep the entire system immune to such populistic uh, uh, moves, even if there are populists of power in various or close to power in various countries, those verdicts uh, form some kind of legal umbrella uh, that could be used in, in other jurisdictions. So let's think positive for the entire union out of this crisis. And for us, of course, there is work for us to do and we will try hard and we do, as you see, Polish judges are on the front line and has been have been for eight years. And I think they are incredibly um, courageous and and incredibly rooted in the EU values. If there is really something like EU values, Polish judges really proved um, that it's worth defending. So um, I would like to thank Polish judges for that as a Polish barrister who stands in front of them, but as, as a citizen of Poland and EU. And I would encourage um, all of you to, to read all of those judgments 
and um, also um, um, the uh, Oshatinsky uh, rule of law um, uh, website where, where there's everything that happens in Poland is in English. Also, our website is full of um, English texts that you can refer to. We published um, a report with American Bar Association yesterday on the link between this destruction and, uh, and the rights of the business, the, the, the world of economy. Uh, so if anybody of um, our participants is, is interested, um, you can find it on the uh, free courts wellness on the website. So let's think positive out of this illness. We can get stronger if we are firmly involved in this battle and also push the politicians on the, the local front and EU front to actually not let go. Thank you. Thank you, Paulina. Uh, we are almost out of time, but we have two very good and interconnected questions regarding the funds. And the first is from Edith Good Przybelska, which um, pertains to the fact that uh, there is a differentiated approach towards Hungary and Poland after the uh, war in Ukraine broke out. How could it impact the release of EU funds? Do you expect that Poland will receive them earlier than Hungary? If so, when and under which conditions do you see it feasible? And the second question is whether um, the um, anti-LGBT zones, the so-called anti-LGBT zones, a repealment is listed in the milestones of the recovery fund. So I get that maybe Jakub. <laughs> Sure, I can take the question from Edith, which is a very good one. Now, the situation with the Polish Recovery Fund and unlocking is it's tied down to a condition of Polish constitutional tribunal quite directly. Um, the Polish government negotiated with the European Commission a subsequent new law, which would once again change the disciplinary proceeding system for judges in Poland. And it was mentioned already earlier today, uh, I would move it to the Supreme Administrative Court. The Parliament passed this law, and then President Andrzej Duda, in a surprise move, sent the uh, law for review to the Constitutional Tribunal. And this review is not going anywhere currently because the Constitutional Tribunal is conflicted. Uh, there is a group of currently five uh, uh, rebel judges who uh, don't want to cooperate with the leadership of the Tribunal, who say that the Tribunal's uh, president's term has run out and basically are obstructing this case. And until this case is being resolved in the Tribunal, this law is not going to come into the force and Poland will not get the recovery fund money, which is creating a very awkward situation for everyone uh, involved on the Polish side. And uh, when this will happen, it's hard to say. The tribunal is uh, conflicted to the attempts to hold a hearing in this case. It is entirely possible that uh, this, uh, at some point this hearing will happen, that the judgment will be passed, and following the judgment, the law will come into the force. But even if that will come into the force, then it has to, this law has to start to effectively work. And this is all very difficult to say at which point possibly Polish recovery fund could happen. On the other hand, when it comes to Hungary, we have seen that the Hungarian government is negotiating with the European Commission. And, uh, uh, the Hungarian situation is different from Polish, among others, and the fact that uh, there is no internal conflict in the Hungarian ruling camp, and everybody is doing what Prime Minister Viktor Orban orders them to do, and there is no room for any dissent or for any internal struggle within uh, the courts or the government. So, in practice, uh, practically, politically speaking, the Hungarian side could move far more faster. So it's difficult to say who's going to be the first to. Yeah, but this question very nicely illustrates the differences between the Hungarian and the Polish situation politically, and the fact that uh, the incoming elections in Poland, which uh, have a very uncertain outcome, could go both ways with uh, a chance for the opposition victory, but also with a chance for the current ruling camp to uh, maintain their majority. This is all making those tensions within the Polish ruling camp a little more. Uh, profound and more impacting also on the areas of the rule of law crisis. So hard to say when it will happen exactly, but um, following this closely and uh, we'll definitely be giving you all heads up when something moves on this front. Mm -hmm. And is anyone willing to say about the content of milestones? 
Well, as I mentioned before, the, the milestones are not met by this law. I mean, they are only declaratively covered, but they are not really because uh, they move uh, this whole disciplinary system and tests of independence to the administrative court, which A, has one third of your judges, nothing prote protects judges to be to be sentenced by those who they don't want to sit in panels with. So it's 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 a vicious circle because we have uh, neo judges deciding among them themselves. We actually formed a mockery of a Roman paremia that it's actually neo judges neo judex in causa sua. Okay, because they always sit in their own cases. They are shamelessly uh, breaching the conflict rules. So uh, this one is not uh, fulfilled. Plus, um, as I said, this court has constitutionally different roles. So proper judges will leave because they will not want to breach the constitution. It has a defined role and cannot do this kind of cases. So it will completely devastate the Supreme Administrative Court. Uh, uh, plus, uh, there is nothing really which uh, blocks muzzle law from being uh, applied. So uh, judges from being chased for, you, for applying EU law. Yes, one of the torts which was there which was questioned by the European Court of uh, Court of Justice of European Union um, is uh, cancelled from the law, but there is still possibilities to harass judges um, for uh, applying EU law. So even on this front, the, the, it's not uh, um, executed. And yes, uh, judges who were expelled by this illegal disciplinary chamber uh, were all allowed back to courts, but they were moved to other departments and they are still subject to harassment. So it's not that uh, this um, uh, system of, of devastating their professional life is somehow blocked, okay? This, this whole um, um, electricity sort of uh, uh, path that the, the government can use is, is, is still there. So we don't have any uh, any resistance in the system uh, dividing the powers. So we believe that this law does not execute the, the milestones. Plus, as I said, those milestones refer only to two verdicts out of 20 something. So uh, this is why the judges of European judges who are governed in a number of organizations, they launched the case to the, to the Court of Justice of European Union against the commission and against the council for limiting those milestones only to two verdicts. So uh, those European bodies are now subject to pressure from two sides, okay? Because European judges say to the, to the institutions within the EU, look, you can agree on stuff politically, but it's gonna be us independent European judges who are uh, faced with judgments of our uh, uh, Polish uh, colleagues who are illegal according to the tribunals which bind us, <laughs> okay? So this whole uh, uh, problem will then drop down on the shoulders of European judges in all of, all of the countries. So um, it's a very complicated picture now. And I think there's gonna be a hearing in this uh, case complained by the, uh, the, the judicial organizations somewhere in June. So we will know more whether they will be allowed also as far as standing is concerned. But it's, it's obvious that there is this solidarity of judges and um, uh, the rebellion, so to speak, against political compromise, which they dis dis disagree with. Thank you. Thank you very much for, um, for all that. And um, unfortunately, our time has run out. So uh, let's enjoy this wonderful afternoon still. And thank you so much for participating. Thank you so much for your comments and questions. And I'm really surprised that so many people uh, joined in the afternoon. So I'm sure that it's because of you, the panelists. And the recording from our today's event will be available quite soon um, at uh, YouTube of the Viktor Osatinsky Archive. And I will also write an article based on our discussion so it will be also uh, available for posterity but let's keep in touch and uh, please do follow in english the rule of law in poland blog and please follow our distinguished panelists and see you very soon thank you so much <laughs>